Hi again. I wanted to take up again this book, Armageddon Now, by Dwight Wilson, published in 1977. It's a fascinating analysis of the growth of premillennial teaching, specifically from the age of Napoleon unto, well, when the book was published in the 1970s, at which time the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, by Al Lindsay, had made very popular certain teachings that back in the, the day, that is in the early part of the 19th century, were limited to a few thousand enthusiasts. But by the time of Al Lindsay's late great planet Earth, not to mention the Watchtower's books about the date 1975, the idea that the end was upon us and that certain signs, including the invasion of Gog of Magog, were sure indicators that the time could not be far away. So the subhead of this book is the pre-millennial the pre-millenarian response to Russia and Israel since 1917. And he's setting the stage in, in this chapter that we were reading from before. He's just mentioned that among the early influences were the great Victorian preacher, maybe the most famous preacher in England in the 1820s, Edward Irving, and Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the famous poet, were two of the early influences upon the Zionist well, not so much the Zionist political movement, but the idea that the restoration of the Jews was a sign that the Second Coming couldn't be far away. And then the influence of Lord Shaftesbury. So I'll take it up with that short last paragraph where Shaftesbury comes in, because Shaftesbury was, of course, an evangelical Christian, and not to mention the most, maybe the most famous reformer in terms of social reform that England had during the entire 19th century. Lord Shaftesbury... Wilson says, was a vigorous promoter of Jewish settlement in Palestine. In his view, such settlement would develop the land between the Mediterranean Sea and the Euphrates River. As a millennialist, he believed that Palestine actually belonged to the Jews and should be returned to them, ideally as Christian converts. Because Jerusalem's first Anglican bishop was Jewish, it appeared to him, that is Shaftesbury, as well as to others, that the restoration had already begun. In 19th century America, general religious interest in Palestine was much more extensive than was pre-millenarianism. From early in the century, there was a manifest there was manifest a missionary interest in the area, both to Jews and to Arabs. By mid-century, an enthusiasm for scientific research and archaeological study had also developed, partly as a byproduct of the religious interest. Fascination was stimulated too by British Romanticism as epitomized by the young Jewess Rebecca in Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe, which, in, by the way, was one of the best-selling books of the 19th century. Along with a multitude of other reforms, American Romantic Utopianism in the Jackson era expressed concern for Jewish homelessness. In 1840, out of humanitarian concern, President Van Buren intervened with the Turkish government on behalf of the Jews in Palestine. And by the latter part of the century, most of the diplomatic exchanges between Turkey and the United States were concerned with the protection of American Jews in Palestine. In 1897, the advent of political Zionism was given at least respectful attention, and prior to World War I, Christian groups more often than not were sympathetic towards Zionism. We should probably place in here the, the thought that one of the early successes of Charles Taze Russell was that he was associated with the Zionist movement and even invited to speak at Zionist events in the World War I period. Wilson goes on, this can best be explained as sympathy for the underdog rather than as a captivating concern for Jewish welfare or restoration. Remnants of these extensive 19th century interests still exist today, but compared to the intensive attention of premillenarians, they have been only passing fancies. A variety of millennial groups developed in the United States in the early 19th century. America in the early 19th century was drunk on the millennium, one source says. A post-millennial view was expressed by the moderator, moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in a speech in London to the Evangelical Alliance in 1846. Quote, I really believe that God has got America within anchorage and that upon that arena he intends to display his prodigies for the millennium. End of quote. The Mormons taught a premillennial eschatology. 
But although they believed in the restoration of the Jews to Palestine, their primary thrust, thrust was the building of their own New Jerusalem. William Miller, the founder of the modern Adventist movement, predicted the second advent of Christ in 1843. His error produced a general disillusionment with premillennial teachings and even made the faithful thereafter a bit shy of date setting. As Ernest Sandine again has so aptly observed, it took a long time for Americans to forget William Miller, the founder of the utopian Oneida community. John Humphrey Noyes, who came to believe that the Second Advent had occurred in A.D. 70, described the general mood of the era. Noyes said, It is certain that in 1831 the whole Orthodox Church was in a state of ebullition in regard to the millennium. A feeling of expectation on this point lay at the bottom of the triumphant march of revivals which shook the land for several years from that time. The Millerites have since met with unbounded ridicule, but it should be remembered that all that portion of the churches who were spiritual, who believed in revivals, and who were zealous and successful in laboring for them, had a fit of expectation as enthusiastic and almost as fanatical as the Millerites. That's the end of the noise quote. Wilson goes on, In the 1850s, premillennialism recovered from the setback, suffered as a result of Miller's errors, and accordingly, writers began to risk works on prophetic themes again. Jacob J. Janeway, a theology, theology professor at the Presbyterian's Western Seminary, published in 1843, Hope for the Jews, or the Jews will be converted to the Christian faith and settled and reorganized as a nation in the land of Palestine. That's the title. <laughs> Wilson explains, Janeway believed the Jews would be restored under the reign of the promised Messiah. The issue of the preconditions for the restoration was to become an item for discussion over the years. Janeway contended that if the Jews returned in their present state of unbelief, they would have no peace or security. He discussed their historical persecution and then, by way of contrast, the renewed interest in returning, mentioning that Quote, a society of Jews has been formed in London with the view of stirring up their countrymen in all lands to seek a repossession of the land. End of quote. For those so predisposed, crises, foreign or domestic, stimulate apocalyptic concern. Even as far back as the late Roman Empire, the patriarch Proclus, who lived from 434 to 447 CE, was interpreting the the Rosh and Meshech of Ezekiel 38 verse 2 as the invasion of the empire by the Huns. Likewise, the Crimean War, just as the Napoleonic Wars before, accelerated the production of prophetic materials. A preacher of the Scottish National Church, John Cumming, published in 1845, 1855 rather, two works which became the seedbed for many premillenarian volumes. One bibliographer claims that Cummings works outsold those of any other writer of his day. One, published in Philadelphia, was entitled Signs of the Times, or Present, Past, and Future, and took as its title page text Luke 21, verse 25, And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of the nations with perplexity. The other book, published in London, was emphatically entitled The End with a somewhat less dramatic subtitle, The Proximate Signs of the Close of This Dispensation. Cumming calculated the year 1864 to be the date of fulfillment of various prophecies. He almost affirmed it would be the end of the world. He said, I do not prophesy, I do not foretell the future, I only tell forth, or forth tell, what God has said, but I do feel that if 1864 be not the close of the age that now is, and the commencement of a better one, it will be a time unprecedented since the beginning, a portentous, startling, and terrible to the enemies of God, but glorious, holy, and full of joyous scenes to the people of God. Well, you can imagine that since it, 1864 is right in the middle of the Civil War, that it must have caused some stirring. The 1260 days or years of Daniel were identified as the era of papal power, which began in 530 when Justinian gave the Pope civil power and ended in 1790. 
with the supposed decline of the papacy. And of course, 1790, we're in the middle of the French Revolution. Daniel's 1290 days brought coming to 1820, which corresponded exactly, according to him, with Daniel's prediction of the end of the Persian Empire, that is, the Turks. The Turks were also identified as Daniel's little horn. The corresponding decline of the Catholics and the Muslims proved to be proved to coming the validity of his system. And as a consequence, Daniel's 1335 days, that's in chapter 12 of Daniel, led him to the end of 18, the end in 1865. He then cited the prediction of the church father Lactantius that the world would come to an end after 6,000 years of existence, supported the idea from Jewish traditions and offered calculations that terminated the 6,000 years in 1862, saying, just as the six days have their seventh, the 6,000 years will have their 7,000, or what we call the millennium. So you can quickly see the parallels with Adventist and Russellite predictions of the significance of these, these periods of time from the book of Daniel. Not exactly the same calculations, but close enough. I'll put in a link to uh, what Barber and Russell said on the 1260 days of the time of the end, which they said ran out in 1798 or 1799. And of course, that means that the 1290 days ran out in 1829 or thereabouts with the rise of Adventism. See you soon.